The Starseed Transmissions and Extraterrestrial Report Introduction It was during a cold and snowy period of 11 days from December 27, 1978 to January 6, 1979 that the whole of this material was recorded. I have taken the liberty of editing out the repetition and rearranging it in chapter format, but aside from that, I share it with you as it was first presented to me. In the years that have passed since those 11 winter days when my little 8x10 office seemed to literally pulsate with the rhythms of some alien, yet hauntingly familiar, intelligence, I have given thought a number of times to publication. Yet my own life has been so filled with the momentum of such incredible change that I have hardly been able, until now, to take the proposition seriously. I can certainly attest to the truth of what is stated in these transmissions, One's life does indeed begin to change when one decides to work with the approaching forces. I hope the significance of this material is not lost to certain readers because of a reluctance to accept its purported origin. Regardless of one's opinion on the plausibility of extraterrestrial or angelic communion, it might be pointed out that the simple act of structuring information in this manner opens up communicative possibilities that are virtually non-existent in a conventional mode. Much of what is communicated in these pages would not easily lend itself to other, more traditional, ways of conveying information. The messages came first in non-verbal form, on waves, or pulsations, that carried the concise symbolic content of what I term, meta-conceptual information. Automatically, it would seem, the nearest approximating words or phrases from the English language would be assigned to ride, as it were, the fluctuations of the non-verbal communications. Often it was the case that the only human conceptual system with approximating terminology was religious. Hence, the occasional use of Christian words and phrases. It is not to be assumed that these always imply the usual assortment of meanings that are generally associated with them. Often the meta-conceptual reality that they are used to represent goes substantially beyond the meaning suggested by their contemporary usage. The communications that are presented in this book seem to have been transmitted neuron-biologically. As I communed with these spatial intelligences, our biogravitational fields seem to merge, our awarenesses blend, and my nervous system seem to become available to them as a channel for communication. During our interviews, I would perceive reality, not only through my own perceptual mechanism, but through theirs as well. The resulting synthesis provided for a relatively accurate approximation in human language of the awareness they brought. In the course of my work with these creatures, I understood them to be focalizations of various essential perspectives. At times I considered these extraterrestrial, at other times, angelic. Occasionally, I thought of the entities as informational cells within a galactic organism of some sort. Toward the end of the transmissions, other, more mythical perspectives emerge, about which I will make no comment here. But by whatever term we choose to understand these entities their purpose in sending these messages has not been to teach us of themselves, but to teach us of our own nature and purpose upon this third planet from the star we call Sun. Chapter 1. Singularity of Consciousness. I come from the presence where there is no time but the eternal now. I retain, even in the midst of this relationship, an awareness of this realm and of the universal being that inhabits it. I come with a message that will prove vital to you in these final days of your history. My individual identity comes into being only as I enter the context of my relationship with you. When I am no longer needed in this capacity, I will merge back into the being behind all being. There I remain in unity and fulfillment until the next impulse comes to send me on another mission. In the interim, there is no distinction between me and the Source. I and others of my kind desire at this time to bring humans to this same level of awareness. I am a focus of collective human consciousness, but at this time you have little conception of what that means.
You do not yet suspect what the singularity of collective human consciousness might be. You still draw identity from the present form of your expression. You feel defined and limited by flesh and bones. You are only beginning to comprehend your oneness with other forms of life. For me to tell you, with these limiting definitions you have of yourself, that I represent an element or a focus of your collective consciousness, would actually be less accurate than to say that I am extraterrestrial I meet the criteria of the latter term in that I do come from outside your planetary field of influence. I bring instructions to your race from the directive organ of galactic being. When you remember your true nature, and begin to draw identity from the totality of your being, then it could be stated with all validity that I am an element of your own consciousness. However, at that point, you will no longer perceive me as you do now. When you have awakened to the reality of your true being, you will perceive me and all my species as being inside yourself. Until then, you perceive me as being outside yourself. There is but the filmiest of screens between your present condition and your true nature. It is our mission to assist you in bridging this gap, to awaken you from sleep, to bring you to the fulfillment of your destiny. The state of consciousness that I represent does not normally verbalize. It is difficult for me to relate what I wish to convey only through the words and concepts with which you are familiar. Your language was designed to facilitate commerce. What we put together with its components can only approximate my meaning. There is another, more ancient language, more conductive to discourse on this level, but you have forgotten it. Its transfer of information is accomplished through the actual projection of living informational units. These units are at once more specific and more inclusive than your words. They have been designed to convey organic information of concise, yet, comprehensive, informational content. Simultaneously with this conceptual communication, you are subliminally receiving this same information through the living language of light, though your preoccupation with words leaves you with no awareness of it at this time. My work will be complete when I have put you in touch once again with this ancient language. When you have learned to allow the silencing of your thoughts and have begun to focus attention on inner vibrational frequencies, you will become aware of a far more comprehensive picture of all that I am now telling you. Until such time as the life-giving information that comes to you from the source of your being is more readily accessible, I will work within the limitations of your linguistic structure and translate as accurately as I am able. Human beings have a tendency to become imprisoned in their concepts. You must remember that words and concepts can be both fallible and misleading. They are not absolutes. Do not contuse them with the realities they represent. No statement that I will make can be taken as an absolute statement, this does not mean that I am coming from a vague place. On the contrary, it means that your words are not precise enough to express the levels of vibratory awareness that I am attempting to communicate through them. If we are able to get the totality of our message through to even a few individual cells of your collective body, these few should be able to translate this information into forms of cultural expression that will bring about your awakening far more effectively than our overt manipulations of the historical process. The message that is revealed in these pages is the key that will unlock your own latent informational input systems. We are here to put you in direct contact with the source of all information. Our mission is to bring a pre-fall state of awareness to all human beings who are able to respond, however different they may be, whatever background there may have come from, using whatever conceptual structures seem appropriate. These individuals will then be instructed to translate this awareness into forms of informational exchange appropriate to their respective cultural situations. As this new awareness increasingly filters into everyday levels of human function, and as more and more individual human cells become aware of what is taking place, the change will accelerate exponentially. Eventually, the psychic pressure exerted by a critical mass of humanity will reach levels that are sufficient to tip the scales. At that moment, the rest of humanity will experience an instantaneous transformation of a proportion you cannot now conceive. At that time, the spell which was cast on your race thousands of years ago, when you plunged into the worlds of good and evil, will be shattered forever.
Even now, with the healing influx of new information, the spell is beginning to lift. Even as I speak. These words, the materializing force fields of bondage and limitation are beginning to lose their influence on consciousness. During this period of vibrational transformation each of you will have a variety of roles to play. Each of you will translate the life impulse into patterns appropriate to your environment, and express this impulse in your daily living. I am now blending my consciousness with the cells of your body in order to provide you with some or the more specific information net that I do occasionally relate, but I do this as little as possible. My primary function is to show you how to tap these systems or data retention for yourself. With guidance, you will learn to release your definitions of who you think you are, open yourself up to the experience of a much greater reality than you presently believe possible, and return to a level of consciousness where you will be able to communicate with us, not through cumbersome words and concepts, but directly, through communion with all that is. Do you want to know more about extraterrestrials? Do you want a definition of angels? We are you, yourself, in the distant past and distant future. We are you as you were, would have been and still are, had you not fallen from your original state of grace. We exist in a parallel universe of non-form, experiencing what you would have experienced had you not become associated with the materializing process. I act in this capacity as a midwife at your birth into form. I am an angel of destiny, a messenger from the stars, but I am also the reflection of your unity before and after matter. I am here to enter your consciousness, here to wake you up. Blending with you now in this communication that is also communion, I can sense a forthcoming period of union. I sense its strange and awesome realities. I feel like an explorer in some vast and uncharted land. Are you aware of the uniqueness of physical reality? I sense both pleasure and pain at my entry into your events. I sense pain at the potential I see wasted and at my own commission to verbalize. But I sense pleasure at what I am experiencing through your senses, for though your sensory channels are, in your exclusive dependence on them, your great limitation, they are also marvelous instruments of perception. They are truly your crowning virtue as well as your tragic flaw. This is the first time that I have had the opportunity to perceive reality in this manner. I have never seen the structure of time and space reduced to such intricate and beautiful patterns. I would look out of your eyes for a while and take in the colors and the room and the trees outside the window, and delight in the curious way you perceive light as illumination. I would love to explore your world in a playful and childlike fashion. I can better understand now how you are deceived such a deep realm of awesome forces, the material plane. Yet you will not be able to continue here much longer if we don't get on with the business at hand. Much that I am now seeing will not survive many more years of human ignorance. It is important that we use this time to supply you with the information you need. It is important that we restore you, as the central control mechanism of this planet, to a proper state of function. Perhaps a day will come, after all has been set to right again, when we can spend some time together just enjoying the wonders of creation. I would delight in an opportunity to travel about with you, seeing what you would show me out of your eyes, hearing what you hear with your ears, feeling the touch of earth on that wonderful substance that is at once both sun and stone. But now there is work to be done. We must forge the conceptual tools that will set you free. Chapter 2. The Other Reality. In your natural state of being, you have no sense of identity distinct from the Creator, except when you are engaged in a relationship. On this level of being, identity comes into focus only in the context of a relationship with some other aspect of being that has become objectified, much as my identity as an angelic messenger comes into being through my relationship with you. When such a relationship is not taking place, that particular expression of you simply does not exist, you float effortlessly in the potential of God. You are not annihilated, but all definitions of you are, and you are released from their restraining influence, allowed to expand into a state of love and perfection. 
by and by, if it should happen that you are needed for a particular function, you will still be there, for your form identity is a specific cell in a specific organ of a larger being. When the next energizing impulse comes, it also brings your definition and instruction. You come into the necessary degree of focus for whatever is required. Throughout the course of your existence, you continually oscillate, like the wave function that you essentially are, in and out of focus, in and out of definition, always moving back and forth, like the pendulum on a clock or the heart of an atom, out of the unity of being with God, into a finite expression of God's infinite potential, and then back into unity once more, back and forth, back and forth. This is the natural rhythm of your existence, just as it is mine. It is the song of God, the rhythm of life itself. Whenever the divine impulse calls upon your services and brings you into form, you encounter other beings of infinite variety, on errands and excursions in worlds of love and light that are impossible to describe. As this happens, you experience, for the duration of your contact, both an identity and a linear time world, but in the course of your encounter, you are still aware of your unity with the Creator. You do not lose the certainty of your oneness with God. You are aware of your form identity and of the motion of time, yet you oscillate, faster than the speed of light, back and forth between your pre-manifest state, and your species role form. This is nothing more or less than every atom of physical creation is doing all the time. Before the fall, you had the ability to shift the center of your awareness from deity to identity, from form to metaform at will. You were free, as it were, to come and go as you pleased, free to emphasize whatever aspect of yourself suited the situation. It is such that all creatures are made. In a healthy state, you are functioning in two realities at once. Half of the time you are focused on your form identity, and the other half on your identity with the totality of what is. In the fallen state of consciousness, you find yourself trapped with your awareness on one side only, while the actual substance of your being continues to function on both sides. This is what unconsciousness is all about. You still exist in that other reality, but you are asleep. In the reality you now think to be the only reality, you are fragmented, the human race seems to be composed of a multitude of beings. In the other reality, there is only you. We are here to wake you up. There is really only one of you who needs to hear this message. It is important that you return to a consciousness of your true self. For though you still exist in both realities, unconsciousness of your identity with the Creator is cutting off the flow of life giving information to the part of you that exists in form. Your existence in identity with God is the reality from which all life springs. Focusing your attention exclusively on form greatly restricts, and eventually curtails, the flow of life currents. As I search your symbol storage systems for a word with which to express something of the reality in which you exist as one with your creator, I come across the American Indian word, Nawal. It is a term which you understand to mean, everything that cannot be named. This is a good word for the region of being, the region of unity. I will use this word for a moment to emphasize a point. In the pre-fall state of awareness, you existed in the Nawal, the All, the Everything, the Nothing, the primal void where all exists in a state of potential. This is the creator that surrounds creation like the sea surrounds a fish. Out of this Nawal, you are called many times to dwell, for the space of a relationship, in its opposite, the Tonal. The Tonal is everything that can be named. It is the imaginary world of God in which all apparent differences exist. It is the playground of what is. The tonal draws all of its sustenance from the Nawal. It cannot exist apart from the Nawal. While the Nawal is a dynamic, yet steady state of rest, the tonal, or manifest physical universe, is continuously flashing on and off. This oscillation occurs in all things manifest, from the smallest subatomic particle to the greatest galaxy. 
all of us, angels, humans, anything that can be named, are only in form one half of the time. The other half of the time we exist in the totality of being. This totality of being that we have been calling the Nawal, has also been called God the Father. It is the life of God the Father that animates all creation. It is this reality that all healthy creatures oscillate back and forth to and exist in half the time. In this reality, we do not exist in time or space, for we can name these, they are both features of the manifest universe. From this spaceless, timeless state we derive all energy, blessing and nourishment. This always holds true, even for you in the fallen condition. The difference is that in the fallen state you are not aware of this process and therefore unable to participate in it consciously. By forfeiting your ability to oscillate in consciousness between the two realities in which you dwell, you are restricted to an awareness of just the tonal, just the material, conceptual world. You still receive your nourishment from the light of the Nawal, but no longer directly, only through animals, plants and minerals. You are unconscious of being and conscious only of form. How did you lose the ability to shift your awareness from deity to identity, from form to metaform? How did you lose God consciousness? How did you fall into the illusion of separation? I will tell you. It was through a simple lack of faith. It was through a loss of confidence in the absolute perfection of the universal design. This was brought about by the entry of a single factor into your existence. Fear, the serpent in the garden, the devil in history. Through a subtle process of reasoning, this being encouraged you to move in a pattern of activity that has come to be called, original sin. It was a pattern of activity that you were never designed to move in. With a clever and subtle lie, you were convinced to not exactly stop trusting in God, but to stop trusting exclusively in God. The moment you did this, your consciousness began to shift from God-centeredness to self-centeredness, and for the first time, you became more aware of your identity in form than of your identity in God. This shift in awareness was minimal at first, but enough to begin what was to become a long spiral downward through denser and denser levels of energy bondage and restraint. For Satan, your tempter, is the materializing influence who in its right place is responsible for the bonding of energy in the creation of matter. As you began to focus more and more upon your identity and form, you began thinking in terms of defending that form with unnecessary and cumbersome ego structures. It became harder for you to avoid identifying with your experience. You began to carry over past patterns of behavioral response into new relationships. This made you less effective in those relationships because you were no longer fully present, no longer using the fullness of your potential. You were beginning to build up around yourself energized thought structures that imprisoned you. You were drawn by simple gravitational attraction, to those realms of space where energy was in the process of being bonded, where matter was being created. Particles of physical substance began to gather along the magnetic lines of your thought structures, and you began to identify with denser and denser levels of physical expression. This process went on for a long while before you actually found yourself in any kind of physical garden. When you did, you had already fallen a long way from your original state of grace, but you were still functioning on a level of awareness far enough above and beyond your present condition to give rise to all the myths and legends of a physical paradise. The physical Garden of Eden lasted for many centuries of Earth time before the momentum of the materializing processes caused you to rely so much upon the physical senses that you became cut off from the direct nourishment of divine light. In reality, you have never been cut off from this nourishment, but as your sense of identity became almost exclusively wedded to your physical bodies, their growing density began demanding more and more earth substance for their support. You finally reached a point where you could no longer meet the demands of your physical bodies without work. It is at this point that your chronicles state that you were driven from the garden. In truth, you were never driven from the garden. The garden is still there, surrounding you even now.
language is only capable of communicating on one level at a time. Yet the fall was a simultaneous multi-leveled occurrence. While you were clothing yourself with increasing layers of material identification, you were also becoming more and more fragmented within yourself. As you began to bring into your relationships a sense of identity based on previous relationships, you were not only lessening your own presence and effectiveness in current relationships, you were also creating separation within yourself. None of your past experiences were comprehensive enough to fully identify with in the present moment, yet you began to rely on them for your understanding of and approach to the present moment. Thus, the whole process of the fall was accompanied by a corresponding fragmentation of your sense of identity, your very sense of self. By the time of the physical Garden of Eden, you were already perceiving yourself to be more than one. The sexual process came into play in order to produce physical projections within which these apparently separate entities you had split yourself into could take form. Even to this day, these apparently separate beings are but your own fragmented reflections. In the fallen state, you perceive them as separate and distinct. Yet, despite all this talk of a fall and original sin, you are not held prisoner by events that transpired in the dim reaches of your collective memory. You are not born into sin. You are born daily into the presence of God, yet daily you re-enact the original foolishness that is recorded in all your ancient chronicles. Daily you commit original sin, daily you eat of the forbidden fruit, and it is from moment to moment that you keep yourself imprisoned by allowing a dubious rational thought process to come between you and your immediate sensing of God's will. This was the hesitation that led to your initial fail from grace, and it is the same hesitation that keeps you now in a fallen state. There should rightly be no interval between the determination of the need to take action and the implementation of that action. This rational interference is what caused you to stumble in your primal dance of trust with God. You are now, in effect, sleeping under the influence of what could almost be seen as a spell, an illusion that prevents you from experiencing the clarity of perception that is your natural birthright. Our mission to this planet is to awaken you from sleep by whatever means necessary.